Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Thank you once again for joining us on tonight. It is just good to come together to uplift the name of Jesus. Please click the share button and start a watch party with your family and friends. Our scripture tonight will come from John 13, verses 34 through 35. John 13, verses 34 through 35. And it reads, A new command I give you, love one another. That is the commandment. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ if you love one another. God is commanding us to love one another. We have to love others just like Christ loved us. And what did Christ do for us? He died on the cross for us so that we might live. So he gave his life for us. Thank God for loving us another day, for giving us a chance to love and also to get it right. God has allowed us to come together one more time one more time, he has allowed us to pray together. One more time, he has allowed us to praise his holy name together. Thank you, God, for allowing us to come together. One more time, one more time, he allowed us to come together. One more time. Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. Lord, we thank you for another chance to honor you by studying your word. Lord, we thank you for another chance to come into your presence, Father God, to hear from you, 
to watch you, to listen to you, to admire you speaking to us. Now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless us, Father God, to hear you clearly. Bless your word that your word will be made clear. Father God, that the habits will be different and strength will be renewed. Father God, that lives will be restored and the dear master, that lives will be saved. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, and anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen and thank God. One more time. One more time. One more time. He has allowed he us. allowed us to praise his holy name. One more time. One more time. One more time. One more time. Hallelujah. He allowed us to praise his holy name. One more time. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. He has given us another chance, another privilege another chance to come before him and honor his name. He's allowing us again to praise his name one more time. We're moving into Colossians chapter three. Tonight, we're at Colossians chapter three in the New Testament. For our Bible study, study we will take on the path of Colossians chapter three on tonight. Colossians chapter three, we'll be looking at the first four verses. Colossians chapter three, verses one through four is where we are tonight. The first sub pericope is found in verses one through four, and then it's a part of a larger pericope, which is verses one through 11. So it may take a while for us to cover this complete pericope because it's divided into sub pericopes. Amen, thank the Lord. Thank you for being on top of that, amen. Uh, we're looking at uh, Colossians chapter three, verses one through four is where we will land tonight. When you found it, you will discover these words. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. My, 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 look at God. He's making a promise tonight. He's making a promise. Remember, remember now, we're in Colossians. Paul is writing this book, this, this particular book of Colossians to the church at Colossae. And as he write this, he has previously in verse in chapters one and two warned them about going through the process of the Old Testament of Judaism, as well as watching these false doctrines and false Christs that will come up, that will pop up and were popping up during that time. He starts off by talking about the circumcision and baptism and communion. He says to, says to them that Jesus Christ is the one who can circumcise you spiritually, that there is no more need for physical circumcision, for God has cut away the heart, the excess from the heart. He talks about baptism and that baptism is how we identify with Jesus Christ. And as we identify with him, we realize that we are already born again. We've already been saved. We, uh, we have already confessed Christ as our Savior, and therefore we gather in baptism to say to the people sitting out there or standing there that we have identified with Jesus Christ, that we identify with him. We believe in this death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then he talks about the communion and fellowship that we ought to have in communion. And as often as we do this communion, we show forth uh, God's, what God had done through Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. He moves and he thought talking about making sure that you don't get caught up in legalism. Don't get caught up in mysticism. And please, whatever you do, make sure you don't get caught up in the things of this world. He talks about legalism, mysticism, 
and he talks more about uh, today in chapter three, he talks more about your personal life. He talks about you making sure that your life is on track with Jesus Christ because Jesus has done some things for you. He has done some things for you that have made you whole. When you receive Jesus Christ, you were made whole, you were made complete. And since you have received him, look at what he says in verse one of Colossians chapter three. He says, then, don't run over that word then because the word then means something uh, other than then. Don't run over the word if. In, in the New King James, it says if then. So don't run over those two small words because this phrase if then means something more than if then. He says, since you have the wisdom, since you have, have been able to over, overlook these false Christs and do not follow the example of these false prophets, he says, if then, meaning that he talked to you in chapter one and chapter two about being buried in Christ. He talks about you dying to yourself and being made alive is what he talks about in chapter three. He says, now that you have died in Christ, now that you have, have died to yourself and you're, not in, and you're not in yourself, you're in Christ. He says, if then, this word if doesn't mean just if, it means since you have. It means because you have. It means whether you have. Finally, it means that uh, for as much, he says, for as much then, he says, since then, he says, because then, he says, if then, since you have been in Christ Jesus, then, this word then means now, this word then means accordingly, certainly, wherefore, he says, look at what he says in verse number one. If then you were raised with Christ, he says, since you have ra been raised, since now you have been raised with Christ, this word raised means to be aroused or be revived. In other words, we were dead in our trespasses. Jesus came along. He roused us. This word, this word raised is the same word roused that Jesus uses when he talks about how he got up from the dead. Paul addresses this word when he, when he says that in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, he says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, Jesus was roused from the dead, Jesus was roused or aroused from the dead. Since Jesus was revived from the dead and you believe that he died, he was buried, he rose. Since he has arose from the dead, since he was roused from the dead, you believe that story and therefore you are raised. Look at what it says. If then you were raised with Christ. In other words, we were dead in our trespasses, but we were raised, we were roused with Christ. Christ, the anointed one, Christ, the Messiah. We were roused with Christ. We were raised with Christ. We have been lifted up with Christ. Let me just stop and tell you, if you're born again, if you are saved, if you are a Christian, if you are a Christian, if you are on your way to heaven, then you have been transported. We talked about that in Philippians. You've been transported to the other side. You've been transported. Even though you're on planet earth, you are with Christ. You have been raised with Christ. Your inner man has been raised with Christ. Your, your sin nature does not have charge over you anymore. You have been raised to another level. And as we go forward tonight, you're going to see what level you've been raised to. You've been raised with Christ. If then, or since then, if then, or since now, you have been raised with Christ. He's saying to us, those of us who are saved, since we have been raised with Christ, since our spiritual man is on a different level now, 
You see, we all were born in sin. We all were shaped in iniquity. We all had fallen short. We were born sinners. We didn't have to go out and do something to be sinners. We were born sinners. And since we were born sinners, then we need Jesus. So when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, then what happened? We were roused with him. So we are with him. We are, we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We were raised with him. Look at what he says. He says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. He says, because since you have been raised with Christ, since you have been born again, since you've been saved, since you have been raised with Christ, you ought to have your seeking in an upward direction. This word seek means to endeavor. The word seek means to inquire. The word seek means to plot. The word seek simply is the same word we use for worship. When we come to worship, we ought to seek God. We don't have time to seek other people. We, we don't have time to seek what other folk have on. We ought to seek God. This word seek means we ought to endeavor. We ought to endeavor to keep our hearts, our minds. We ought to strive. Look at what he says. He says, since you have been raised with Christ, because you've been raised with Christ, because now you've been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. You ought to endeavor to inquire about those things. You ought to plot. You ought to set up a pattern of, of seeking those things which are above. You ought to worship. You, your mindset, your, your heart ought to be turned. This word seek means to strive. We ought to strive toward those things which are of God. We ought to strive every day toward those things which are of God. He says seek those things which are above. There are some stuff on planet Earth that is just in the gutter. There are some things that we deal with from day to day. It's just in the ghetto. It's in the gutter. It's, it's beneath us. The text says, seek those things which are above. Things on Earth are temporary. Things on Earth are temporal. Things on Earth are fading away. He says, think those, think on those things, seek those things which are above. He says, endeavor those things which are above. Look for those things. This word above means upward. The word above means on top. This word above means high. You see, the thing about it is, everybody talking about their haters. Your haters can't, you can't last at high altitude. Miss Obama was right. She says, when they go low, we go high. When you go high, those haters can't hang up there. So he says in the text, seek those things which are above, not these earthly things. What we drive, what we, where we live, those things are fine, those things are good. But you ought to strive for those things that are above what you see every day. When he talks about seeking, he's talking about endeavoring to look at those things which are unseen. Strive for those things that are unseen. We have a reward one day. You ought to strive down here so you can get a great reward over there. And as we go through this chapter, it's going to hit us dead between the eyes when it talks about the sins that we get caught up in. It's going to tell us to stop doing that. Now, that ought to pique your interest to go ahead and read chapter 3 and chapter 4. It's going to let us know that we need to seek those things which are high. Seek those things which are upward. Seek those things which are on top. Those things that you don't see every day. Those things that are not temporary. Those things that are eternal in heaven. Seek those things. Seek them. Go after them. Uh, strive for them. This is where our hearts ought to be. In, in verse number one, he tells us where our hearts ought to be. It tells us that our hearts ought to be on those things above. 
We ought to strive for those things above. We ought to strive to please God and not please men. We're in a bad situation today. We're in a tough spot today. Our nation is in a tough spot today. But if somebody would just seek those things which are above and stop looking at the things that you can see, stop looking at the things that are temporary, stop looking at success as you know it and look for something that God hadn't shown you yet. When we read the word, when we study the word, we're asking God to show us something that we can't see with our natural eye, something that we can't feel with our natural heart something that we cannot see with our natural vision, something that our mind cannot, cannot conjure up. God, you show us. We ought to seek those things which are above. Look at what he says, where Christ is. We ought to seek those things which are heavenly things. Our hearts ought to be turned toward heaven. You know, some people believe that they got time to get it right None of us have time to get it right because we don't know when our time is going to be up. We, we need to get it right today. We need to, we need to look at heavenly things today. Stop gossiping about people and talk about things. You see, even on planet earth, even on the earth where we live, people who are successful, people who are going somewhere, they're not talking about people. They are talking about inventions. They're talking about things. They're talking about things that's going to get them to the next point in their lives. Some would say the next level. You ought to be talking and thinking and seeking those things other than what you see every day. You ought to, you ought to be talking about it. And you ought not be talking about others who are seeking things that are high. It says... Seek those things which are above where Christ is. Where is Christ? Christ is above. Look at what it says. Sitting at the right hand of God. He's sitting. Christ is above. He is sitting at the right hand of God. He is seated at the right hand of God. This word seated or sitting simply means that he's stationary. He is maintaining. This word seated, this, this word, he is, he is sitting or seated at the right hand of God on the right side. It didn't say the left, it says the right side. Many times the Bible talks about the right side as the powerful side. That's why, that's why when it talks about the angel, he has, he has the weapon in his right hand. It's the, it's the place of power. It's the seat of power. It's not like today's politician, the left and the right. It is Jesus' spot. See, the right think that they are right because they are on the right. Jesus is right because Jesus sits on the right hand of the Father. And he's sitting there. He's not just sitting there idle. The Bible says Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father and he's making intercession for you and me. We who are saved, he's making intercession for us. We who are saved, who, who will confess our sin, Jesus saying to God, okay, God, I died for him. God, give him another chance. God forgive them. They've confessed the sin. They've asked you for forgiveness. Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father, and he's making intercession for us. This is a spiritual happening. This is something that takes place that Jesus has gone into the courtroom, and he's interceding for us because we're guilty. We cannot be right on our own. We can't do things right. I don't care how holy you are. I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how long you've been singing, how long you've been preaching, how long you've been teaching. You are not holy on your own. You need Jesus. So that's why Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. He is sitting there. And when we mess up, and we, we are obedient to the spirit and we confess our sin, Jesus said, God, give them another chance. Yes. I know what they did could have been enough for you to kill them, but give them another chance. Yes. 
Not only is he dealing with us physically, he's mostly dealing with us spiritually. God wants us to grow spiritually. God wants us to be different than what we were last year. And let me tell you, if the coronavirus has not made you more spiritual, it has made you more carnal. If not being in church have not, if not being in church have not made you more spiritual, then it has made you more carnal. Because we get together and we worship and we fellowship. And you know, whenever you want to fire, you put the logs close together. And that's what was happening for some of us in church. Because we came to church uh, seeking those things which are above. When we got to church, we fellowship and every log kind of blend with the other and every log kept the other log on fire. Back home in Mississippi, what we would do when we want to put the fire out, we separate the logs. When we want the fire to burn, we put the logs close together. And when you put the logs close together, they keep heat. And they generate heat. And they pass heat from one end and from one log to the other. I know we are not in church. I know we are hurting. I know we need to be in church now more than ever before. This pandemic has separated us, but we ought to be spiritual enough and attend worship enough, even on the air, where we can stay strong and stay powerful. Yes, yes, yes. God has called us to continue to be strong in him. Mm. Jesus. Now, now if, that, if you're not that tonight, if you're not working on staying strong tonight, Jesus is on the right hand of the Father. He's making intercession for you. All you got to do is confess your sin. Lord, you know, I have not been reading my, my word the way I ought to. You know, Lord, I wait to Wednesday and Sunday and some Tuesdays to, to get my Bible out. You know, Lord, I haven't been spending quality time with you. The Bible says in 1 John 1 and 9, you need to run to Jesus. Confess your sin. And as you confess your sin, he is faithful and he is just to forgive your sin and cleanse you of all right, unrighteousness. So you got to make sure we're in a different world today. We're in a different worship today. We're in a, a different arena today, but you can't give up on God. Yes, yes. And you cannot let this separate us from God. Romans says, Paul says in Romans chapter eight, what can separate us from the love of God? Not power, not death, not separation, not perplexities. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And you ought not let God be separated from you. Because guess what? If there's a separation between us and God, God never moved. Who moved? No, he didn't. God never moved. So we ought to be running to God. Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father. So he says, Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1, he says, whatever you do, since you're raised with Christ, you ought to seek those things which are above. You ought to strive for those things. Your heart ought to be turned toward those things which are above. Where Christ is, where is Christ? Sitting at the right hand of God. Yes. Sitting at the right hand of God. He's sitting at the right hand of the divine supreme God. He's sitting at the right hand of the divinity himself. Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand. We ought to be focused on that. We ought to be focused on things that are in heaven. We ought to be, th I think CNN got more coverage, ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC got more coverage this last month than ever before, last 30 days. And the ratings are still up there because we are focusing so much on what's going on on planet earth, we forgot what's going on in heaven. We got to focus on what's going on above. Therefore, therefore, when we see what's going on on planet earth, then we ought to talk to the God who's in heaven. When we understand when, when one side is right, the other side is wrong, or no side is right, then we ought to talk to God. As a matter of fact, we ought to be talking to God before anybody go wrong or right. Verse number two, 
In the first, first verse, he talks about keeping your heart striving toward those things which are above. In verse number two, he says, not only should you set your heart on striving and seeking those things which are above. In verse two, he says, set your mind on things above mm -hmm. and not those things on earth. So first of all, he says, stri strive with your heart in verse number one. In verse number two, he says, set your mind. This word set means to entertain your mind. Right. This word set means to exercise your mind. This word set means to, to show interest with intensity. This word set means to regard. Word set means to think or to fix as to fix your eyes. In other words, the eyes of your mind ought to be fixed on those things which are above and not those things which are on planet Earth. Verse number two says, set your mind on things above, not, those th not, not on things on planet Earth. We ought not think so much on those things on planet Earth. I said to a person the other day, you're so fixed on buying that item until you're more fixed on buying that item than you are on the things of God. And I just want to stop right here and let you know. When you pray, ask yourself before you pray, how does this item benefit God? How does what I'm going to ask God for benefits God? How would a new car, how would a new house, how would a, would a new person, how would a new child benefit God? How would God get the glory from this? Mm -hmm. Ask yourself, where is the glory that will go to God? Mm -hmm. Set your mind, set your mind, set your mind, set your mind. This word mind is your affection. So he deals with the heart in verse number one, and he says your heart ought to be striving for those things which are above. Verse number two, he deals with the mind, your affections, what, what you're in love with, what you regard as special to you. He says, set your mind on things above, not on things on earth, because things on earth will rot. Things on earth will rust. Things on earth will be eaten up by the moth. It doesn't matter how, how clean your rags are. <laughs> doesn't matter how clean your clothes are. The moth is going to eat them up. Doesn't matter how clean your ride is. It's going to rust one day. Some of it just going to fall apart because they don't make metal cars anymore. It's plastic and, and, and fiberglass. But these things are temporary. And when you look at your house, you may be benefiting yourself by staying in your old house because when you're in your old house, they use real wood. Mm -hmm. Now they're using pressed wood where they got chipped up recycled wood and pressed it together. Mm -hmm. And the big bad wolf can huff and puff and blow your house down. Mm -hmm. So he says, set your mind on things above, not on things on earth, on the earth. Stay focused on godly stuff. Stay, stay focused on what God is doing. During this pandemic, we ought to be asking, God, what are you doing? God, just be honest with God. God, I don't understand what you're doing. So many people have asked us to, to go back to the church and start by worshiping at the church. Well, I say to you today, we are probably five times worse off with this pandemic than we were when we stopped going in May. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we have all these holidays and we have the cool season and, and people, and then most of all, we don't have people, we don't have people that's doing the right thing. People still fighting over masks, mm -hmm. still fighting over not having parties, mm -hmm. still fighting over not going to their favorite spots. Yeah, it looks like it's not fair when you don't go to church and, and you, you got people who are flying on airplanes, riding on cruise ships, and we can't go back to church. I know it looks like it's not fair, but the fact of the matter is we have to make sure that we operate in wisdom. Mm -hmm. 
if it was bad enough in March for us to quit, and it's five, ten times worse now, is it bad enough, bad enough for us to stay out? You can't let this situation separate you from the love of God, not from God, or separate God from your love for him. Yeah, we ought to, we ought to make sure that we stick with him. Think on those things. Put your mind, your affection on those things which are above and not on planet Earth. And if you're struggling right now, just say, Lord, help me to focus on those things which are above. Help me to focus on your word. That's why we ought to do two things when we, we read the word. We ought to pray the word and we ought to pray over the word. We ought to pray the word. In other words, God, your word says that if I keep my mind on those things that are above, we will be blessed. So pray the word. God, God, your word says that we will be blessed. Your, your word says, Lord, if I do this, you will do that. God, your word says, always tell God what God has already said. Yeah. Every parent loves to hear his or her child repeat what they told them that was right. Ruby Bridges says that when she was walking in this school, first African-American girl to walk in the school at the age of six, her mama didn't even explain to her what it was all about. But she did say to her, when you go to school, you better not cause any trouble. <laughs> How do you explain to a six-year-old that, that there will be people hollering and screaming and, and cussing at a six-year-old girl? What she was saying to her, Ruby, whatever you do, keep your mind focused on those things which are above. Yes. Keep your mind focused on the prize. Just remember, you're setting a standard for many, many people to come. Stay focused on those things that will get you blessed. Yes. Don't focus on what's going on around you. No, don't focus on uh, people screaming and hollering and throwing bricks and balls. You just walk in the door. And Ruby, if you keep your mind on those things that your mind ought to be on, you're going to open the door for millions upon millions of people. Ever since that day, we've been walking in doors that God opened for us because one little six-year-old was able to get her ponytail straight, sticking behind her head and walk in the door. And now because of this one little girl with her straight ponytail sticking out and holding her little briefcase, walking in the door, there's another woman walking in the door <laughs> that looks just like her. Right. When you keep your mind focused on those things which are above, God can bless you. But as long as you're on planet Earth, focusing only on those things on planet Earth, you will never live up to your godly potential. Young people, young people, don't focus on what you could be doing. Just focus on what God is doing right now. I mean, young people are just having fits. They can't make it out to be with their friends. And and and, and I know it gets to be a big much because some days I just have to walk outside and smell the air myself. But the fact of the matter is, we know that there's a greater success. And I always tell people it's, 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 it's more comfortable to wear a mask than it is to have a, a plastic and glass tube thrown down your throat. It's more comfortable to put your mask on, wear your mask, make sure you keep your distance, make sure you treat people right, than to have a tube thrust down your throat because you got in touch with the wrong person. <laughs> keep your mind focused on those things other than what you see. He says, he says, verse number three, Colossians chapter three, verse number three, for you died. He says, for you died, your sins. You died to your sin nature. You died. He says, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. He says, you died. You're, you died. The old you, and somebody will tell you every time somebody, somebody ruffles their feathers, they'll tell you, now you don't want the old you to come out. You don't want the old me to come out. I don't want the old you to come out. You have, the old man is dead. The old girl is dead. The old woman is dead. The old boy is dead. Keep him dead. 
Don't let him come back up. Regardless of what people say to you, regardless of how people treat you, keep that old man suspended below. Keep him dead in the grave. Look at what it says, verse number three, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are dead. You are, you are out of here. Your, your life as you used to be when you were a natural man, a natural woman, a natural girl, a natural boy, you no longer are that person now. You are no longer that person. And because you're no longer that person, act like you got a new home. Act like you got a new God. Act like you got a new Savior. Act like you got a new spirit, the Holy Spirit. So he says, whatever you do, make sure you understand you died. Paul picks this thought up in Romans chapter 7 when he says, every time I would to do good, evil is present with me. He says, in my mind, in my heart, there's a law. But in my members, in my flesh, this law that's in my mind is coming under subjection to the law of sin, the law of my flesh. He says, I'm saved. I'm born again. And even though we're saved and born again, we still have that sin nature that tries to rise up every now and then. Paul says, it's a struggle. It's a war going on within me. In literary terms, they tell you there are three things. There are three battles. There are three wars. There are three different conflicts. Number one, man against nature. Number two, man against man. And number three, man against himself. There are several other conflicts, but you can find these conflicts in these three. Number one, Man against man, there's always somebody that's going to try to tear you down. Man against man. Then number two, man against nature, the elements beat upon our physical bodies, hold us back sometimes. I just wish the weather man, the weather man didn't even come on on Fridays and Saturdays. Because when, when the weather man comes on and says it's going to be two drops of rain, sometimes people just bag off Sunday morning. Man against nature. And finally, man against man, man against himself. It's when man talks himself out of blessings. It's when man has a conflict going on. Paul says there's a spiritual conflict going on in each one of us. We got our heart set on doing good. We got our mind set on doing good. But there's a law that, that keeps popping up. There's a conflict that keeps going on. There's a flesh that keeps rising up. And this flesh that of the old man keeps trying to pull us down. Romans chapter 7. Paul says, O wretched man that I am. Romans chapter 7, verse number 24. O wretched man. O, o burdensome man that I am. O, o beaten up man that I am. I've been beat down. Paul says, I'm being beat down by the old man. He says, I've been beat down by this old man, and this old man that I used to be is coming in conflict with my new man. But Paul says here to the church at Colossae, he says in Colossians chapter 3, verse number 3, for you, you, for you died, mm -hmm. and your life is hidden with Christ and God. This word hidden means that, that it has been concealed. It has been covered. It has been kept in secret. Let me just share with you. If you're saved, you will always be saved. If you're born again, you will always be born again. You cannot because you've been sealed. You've been hidden in Christ. You've been kept secretly in Christ. You've been covered in Christ. He says you've been hidden with Christ in God. See, once you're saved, once you're born again, you can't get unborn because the new birth experience is not dependent on what you've done anyway. The new birth experience is totally dependent on what Christ did for you over 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary. Christ died, he was buried, he rose, and he was seen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. Christ died, 
She was buried, he rose, and he was seen. Those four things make you say. Just trust the story. It's a simple story. And now because you have trusted this story, you are hidden, you are concealed in Jesus Christ. You're there. When I worked at the chemical plant, we used to have to load trucks and then we would not only load trucks, but we would use, re, road, load railroad box cars and, and railroad tankers. When we closed the lid on the railroad tanker, we would take a rubber seal or a metal seal, most commonly metal seals, and we would take the seal and it had a number on it, a long digit, probably 12 digits on it. It would take that seal and we would clamp that seal to the top where nobody can open it. Now, the seal did not keep you from opening it. You could manhandle it and open it, but we would know if you broke the seal, somebody had been in there because you, you can't redo the seal. What I'm saying to you is Jesus has sealed us to the day of redemption. And the next verse is going to tell us about that. Jesus, we've been sealed. We've been hidden in Jesus. We've been concealed. We've been hidden in Jesus Christ. We've been hidden in him. We've been born again. We're saved. We're on our way to heaven anyway, anyhow. We're on our way to heaven. We ought not live any other kind of way other than the fact that we're on our way to heaven. We ought to live like we're on our way to heaven. We ought to love like we're on our way to, the way to heaven. We ought to treat people like we're on our way to heaven. Last few years, we've been seeing folk being treated any kind of way. I mean, our nation is more divided than even in the 60s, even in the 50s. Our nation is more divided today than it ever have been. Because somebody got a little child locked up in them. And that little child is always trying to have his way. Yeah, leaders have little children locked up in them. Two-year-olds that say they're in their 70s. Pastor Alvin Moulton did an excellent job in describing this little, he talks about how psychologists have identified in every person there's a, there's a baby, a child, a little, a little spoiled brat locked up in all of us. Mm -hmm. Pastor Alvin Moten says that that little boy ought to be suppressed. That little girl ought to be held down. That little girl ought not be able to rise up and treat people any kind of way. Because all of us from time to time just want to have it our way. It's a little child, right? And, and, and grown men and grown women will throw temper tantrums because they're letting that child rise up. It's a child in us. But, but, but the text says, the text says that we have died to that. Mm -hmm. The text says we are now hidden with Christ in God. We are hidden. We are concealed. We, the, whatever God puts in us, it is sealed to the day of redemption. Mm -hmm. It is there. Don't let people tell you, well, you can lose your salvation. If you can lose it, you never had it. If you can lose it, then Jesus did not seal you. If you can lose it, then you're not hidden in Christ. You're not hidden with Christ in God. You're not hidden in Christ. When Christ hides you or seals you or conceals you, you are there. And that's good news. That's good news. Now, you may not act like you're a child of God all the time. Raise your hand if you don't act like it. Raise your hand, Sister David. Raise your hand if you don't act like you're a child of God all the time. If you don't act like you're the child of God, you're still a child of God because when you are in him, you have the right relationship in him. But when you don't act like you are a child of God, you've fallen out of fellowship with him. When you look at Luke chapter 15, you see this, this boy that took, took his daddy's stuff, went on a far journey, and he found himself in a hog field, just about to eat the hog food. He spent all that his daddy had given him. He was still his daddy's son, but he was just his daddy's bad son. He had fallen out of fellowship with his daddy. 
That's why he said when he got when he had spent all, he was just about to eat the hog huff that the hogs eat. He said, I will arise and go to my father and I'm going to apologize to him. I'm going to say to my father, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. But because he had a relationship with the daddy and relationship was still intact, because he was still his son, he couldn't make him a servant. Mm -hmm. He is always his son. Mm -hmm. And so he says, come on back. My son that was dead is now alive. My son that was lost is now found. Come, servant. Bring some shoes, put it on his feet. Bring a ring, put it on his hand. Bring a coat and put it on his shoulders. And that fatty calf that we've been saving up for for cow killing time, a, a cow uh, for for a hog killing time, go out there and get the fatty one. And let's make merry. My son that was lost is now found. My son that was dead is now alive again. And the Bible said, and they began to make merry. Because once you're in his hands, you can't get out of his hand. John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30, talks about the fact that once you're in the palm of hand of Jesus, no one can take you out of his hand because you've been sealed. Yeah. He says that I know my sheep and not, they, my sheep will follow no, none other. And my sheep know my voice. And they won't even hear and listen to anybody else. The problem is we listen to other folk. We listen to other people other than Jesus Christ, our Savior. Mm -hmm. Verse number four. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. This word life, it says Christ, who is our life. Word life is our very spiritual existence. This word life is our operations. The word life is our living. How is your living? He says Christ is our very life. He's our very existence in the spiritual realm that I'm talking about. I'm talking about seeing things from a spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. In a spiritual realm. If you're going to see things in a spiritual realm, you can only see it through Christ. And Christ is our life. Look at what he says. Verse number four. He says, when Christ, who is our life, appears. <laughs> this word appears means manifestation. The word appears means to show himself. The word appears means to declare him and his glory. So when Christ appears, we will also appear with him in his glory. What do you think he's talking about? He says here, in verses number one through three, he says, you have been raised with Christ. And since you've been raised with Christ, you ought to seek those things which are above. And in the process of seeking those things which are above, you ought to seek Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father. And he's sitting there making intercessions for you and me. And he says, set your mind, fix your mind on things which are above, not those things which are on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Fix your mind on it. You fix your mind on it. When, when, when the Hebrew writer says, looking unto Jesus, the author in the finish of our faith, what he's really saying is that you can look at your troubles. Mm -hmm. You can glance at your troubles, but fix your eyes on Jesus. Mm -hmm. Put your attention on Jesus. Put your, put your, bring your troubles and leave them with Jesus. It says, fix your eyes on him. Set your mind on things above and not things on earth. For you have died to the things on earth. And your life is hidden in Christ Jesus. When Jesus, who is our life, appears. You do know Jesus is coming back, right? He is going to appear. And this is a good place to shout right here. He says, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. 
He's talking about the rapture here. <laughs> he, he is talking about one of these days, the same Jesus that died for our sins, the same Jesus that mean men killed, the same Jesus they buried in Joseph's brand new tomb, the same Jesus that got up early that third day morning, the same Jesus that was seen by over 500 men at one time, that same Jesus is coming back. Wow. That same Jesus is going to crack the sky one day. Paul says in Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 rather, he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, behold, let me just show you how this thing going to work out. Don't, don't, don't be saddened. I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. Those who have fallen asleep, they're going to leave planet earth before you do. The Bible says that we will not precede them, but we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. The rapture is coming. Jesus is coming back. Nothing else has to happen before he gets back. Amen. Everything has already happened. We just got to keep preaching the word. We don't know when he's showing back up. Amen. The text declares that, that when he comes back, he's going to bring the saints back with him. One of these days, that's good news. One of these days, because we have trusted Jesus to help us get out of planet Earth and get us to heaven, one of these days, the same Jesus that's sitting on the right hand of the Father, the same Jesus that died for our sins is going to attract the sky one day. Paul says, at the trump of God, at the voice of the archangel, Jesus will crack the sky. And the dead who died with this lively hope, the dead who died as Christians, the dead who died believing the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection will be caught up with him in midair. Yes. And then it says those of us who remain will be caught up with them in midair. And it says, and we will forever be with the Lord. Final verse, verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 Verse 18, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says it like this. Comfort one another with these words. It's comforting to know that our brother, the Savior of the world, he's coming back to get a church without a spot or a wrinkle. He's coming back to get a church that's been faithful. He's coming back to get a church that won't let the virus keep them from worshiping him. We need to worship him. We need to celebrate him. We need to seek him. Regardless of our location, we have to be on one accord and thank him for who he is and what he's already done. There are so many who has been, been taken out by this virus. If we can still breathe, we ought to use our last breath to praise him Amen. and thank him for what he's done. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus. This is your moment. This is your moment that you can get to know Jesus Christ. The one we're talking about coming back to get us. You can be on that flight too. It is that life flight. The flight for Jesus. The flight with Jesus. The flight of God. If you want to go to heaven when you die, you need to join me in this simple prayer. Trusting that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And out of obedience to God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. If you can just believe the story that Jesus died for your sins, he was buried, he rose from the dead, and he was seen by Peter, seen by the twelve, he was seen by over 500 men at one time. If you can trust this story to get you from earth to glory, you can be saved right here, right now. If you would, just bow your head with me and invite him into your heart. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. 
Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And thank God. We believe that if you honestly prayed this prayer, trusting in the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we believe that you're born again. You're on your way to heaven. I believe that you ought to join a great Bible teaching church where, where Jesus is first place. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is first place. You can even do it from a distance. You can even do it by way of broadcast. You can even do it by way of the internet. Just inbox me and let me know that you want to be a member of the New Beginning Church. We'll be glad to take you in and you can be a part of this great family of, church, of faith. And if you need prayer, just inbox me and let me know you need prayer and we'll be glad to pray with you and pray for you. If you receive Jesus Christ tonight during this service, Please inbox me. Let me know that you've received Christ so we can rejoice with you and we can celebrate your newfound faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for being a part of our service. Just remember that Jesus has sealed us. He has hidden us. We are hidden with Jesus in God, the supreme God, the great magistrate, the judge himself. He will judge us one day but we've been sealed in him. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. Don't wait till Sunday to give. Go ahead and give right now. Sunday is not promised to us. You can give by three different ways. You can give in three different ways. You can give by way of Cash App. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. You can give by way of Cash App. Or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. You can give by way of Zelle. Or you can mail your check to the New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503. Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. We'll be glad to receive your offering and, and your tithes. Thank you for joining us here tonight uh, for our Bible study. We're here every Wednesday night at 7.20 p.m. Thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you to our visitors for being a part of tonight. Please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our Sunday school. Our regular Sunday school is 9 a.m. Sunday morning on Facebook Live. And also worship service at 1045. Our broadcast is 1045 worship service, 1045 a.m. every Sunday. Please be a part of our service and please uh, pray with us and pray for us. Thank you so much for joining us again here at the New Beginning Church. Thank you for being a part of this service. Thank you so much for being a part. We do have some people that we are, that are on our prayer list. And let me thank those of you who joined us in prayer on last night. We have our phone conference prayer on second Tuesday, which was last night. And on fourth Tuesday, we have our Zoom prayer uh, on fourth Tuesday, 7 uh, p.m. on second and fourth Tuesday. We are praying for Michael Shelley. We're praying for Pastor Ford. That doesn't sound right. I don't think it's Pastor Ford. Okay, Pastor Ford. Uh, uh, we are also praying for uh, Benny Brown. Benny Brown. Uh, we're praying for the Jacksonville Health Care facilities, all of which are struggling with the virus. We want to, to lift up them for the virus. We're praying for Sue McCain for salvation and, and for her family. We're praying for Sister Corey Woods. We're praying for the drive-through on this coming Sunday. We're celebrating 16 years. Um, this is a 16th year appreciation for Sister Davis and myself at the New Beginning Church. We've 
want you to come by and drive through at the at the church. Uh, please join us uh, and drive through at the church and help us in our celebration. It'll be a drive through, not a drive by. It'll be a drive through. Come on by and drive through with us and let us see your face. We haven't seen you in about eight nine months now. Please come to through and drive through. We'll be glad to see you. Help us celebrate. Please, ma'am. Please, sir. Keep praying. Praying with us. I ask the Whitlocks to make sure that I have a right name for the pastor. Uh, I don't remember. Pastor Ford. Pastor Floyd is what it is. Pastor Floyd. Pastor Floyd. I know if Pastor Ford did not sound right. Thank you so much, Brother Miles. Praying for Pastor Floyd. <clears throat> and uh, we're lifting all these before the Lord. And we're asking the Lord to continue to bless us and keep us and protect us. Looking forward to seeing you Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Sunday morning at 9 a.m., 10.45 a.m., and again, Wednesday at 7.20. In between those times, please come on Sunday, uh, Sunday evening, Sunday evening at 4 p.m. and drive through and help us celebrate 16 years at the New Beginning Church. Thank you so much. God bless you, and God keep you is our prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. We thank you, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for keeping us and blessing us, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you've sealed us through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you are protecting us to the day of redemption. We thank you for blessing us, Father God, that we are walking with you. Our old man is dead, and we don't have to obey him any longer. In Jesus' name, we pray that you continue to give us strength, give us hope, and give us power. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank God. We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, if I and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.